Hello everyone, I'm here to introduce another discussion with a museum professional. In this video, I'm joined by Richard Wakeman, who works at the British Museum. I'm really excited about this because in my museum courses, I always include the British Museum. Uh, you may remember it's the first national public museum of the world, and it was the first museum to cover all fields of human knowledge and was aimed at all studious and curious persons. This is really interesting to me because I think it, at the time it was very huge to try and cover all fields of human knowledge and even now it's hard to do that. As you'll see in our discussion, he actually mentioned that quote that I mentioned all studious and curious persons. That's what they originally aimed to do and that's what they still do today. Richard Wakeman is an assistant collections manager at the British Museum, so I'm sure you'll learn a lot from him. So this discussion will go the same as always. I'll show it to you. And I should say these discussions are virtually uncut. So everything you see here is the discussion as it was. And then you can think about the questions and I'll send them to the person after. So if you have any questions for Richard, definitely let me know and write them down as you watch. And I'll highlight a couple of comments that I think about. Hello, I'm here with Richard Wakeman, who's the Assistant Collections Manager at the British Museum. Can you tell me a little bit more about that role, Richard? Uh, yeah, um, I've been in a role for about five years and working at the museum for about 19 years now. Um, and the role is pretty much the cogs in the machine of a specific department. So I'm Assistant Collection Manager for the Britain, Europe and previously Bond. Um, which goes all the way back from um, Stone Age, Bronze Age, and can go all the way up to modern Bauhaus teapots, which I was working with this morning. Um, so it's quite a varied department. Um, the actual role itself could be handling objects from all areas of that department, which it covers. Um, and we install objects in exhibitions in-house um, from normal displays. We also take um, objects around the world. Um, we also help out of departments. Um, so. I was working with the Egyptian department last year and they were taking uh, mummified remains to the uh, Royal Ontario Museum. And um, that is a traveling exhibition which travels around the world. Everywhere our objects go, a member of staff goes around the world with it. Um, so that's part of the job as well. We take objects to photography departments. We look after students when our students' rooms used to be open to the public. Um, hopefully they'll be open again soon, um, COVID permitting. Um, so yeah, we do a lot of interaction with visitors online via student rooms and we do um, displays we change things around uh, when we can as well for galleries to uh, interact with visitors so um, it's quite a varied varied role i hope i've sold it well is that hard preparing objects to be moved around like that yes yes um, every object is different um, and some people will say the same way you can pack uh, an object um, should be all the, all the same kind of like methods, whereas you can't pack a uh, one ton Assyrian uh, relief or a two ton Egyptian sarcophagus the same way if you would pack uh, an Iron Age axe or a piece of jade from China. Um, so there are different, there are some similar rules and some similar materials, but the care that has to go into each individual item uh, can be quite precarious. Um, so some objects might need physical force or literally a forklift truck to move around for us. Um, some objects are about this big. I took a couple of um, stone axes to Paris and um, even though they're about this big, the crate and the materials had to be quite big just to get them safely from one place to another. Um, and the logistics of planning how you get an object from one place to another carefully um, can be delayed even by an elevator not working or a truck that breaks down on a road in Paris, which uh, has also happened. Um, but it can be quite fun figuring out the different materials that need the actual plan of where the object's going um, in a different country. Um, and we've been doing a lot of video installs recently as well. So I packed a lot of objects um, which then get transported and then had to do it via video. Um, even though I couldn't go with it, I had to go via video for the curators installing at the other venue, um, so which makes it seem like an object layer which project kind of scenario. It's quite odd, but it's, nothing's gone wrong so far. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. My colleagues did, um, they were doing it in rotation for um, the Mummies exhibition in Toronto um, with their colleagues over at the other museum. So there's lots of uh, mummies being moved about by video. Uh, but yeah, nothing went wrong. But I know. 
You're talking a little bit about one of the questions I had for you. Um, the British Museum has a really good online collection. Do you, are you participating in that a lot? Um, in regards to the database or the what you actually see on the collection online section? The database, but yeah, you talked a little about making the behind the scenes accessible to other people too. Yeah, um, one of the best things that I found out when I started working in the museum, I got my induction. And every time you go to an induction in a place, you're always going to get the best kind of like, oh, the museum, isn't it fantastic? Isn't it great? We do this. Uh, but one of the best things I got told was when the museum collection was put together by um, three different benefactors. The rule was that it's open for all studious and curious people. And that is the kind of rule that still we try and go by. So if we've got an object and a member of public um, wants to see it, even if it's in a store or something, if they can provide good reason and documentation, uh, then they have the right to see it. Um, so that includes the study rooms as well. So they can actually make an appointment um, to actually go to the museum, um, show some ID, and then if there's printing drawings, they can go and see Da Vinci's or Raphael's or Albert Durer's or um, if it's a certain part of an excavation or archives, then you can actually make a specific appointment to go to see that individual bit. Um, but if somebody's all the way around the world, um, and they can't travel, which is kind of like now, um, mm -hmm. you know, online. And if they want to get more information on that, they can actually follow links and actually speak to curators. And they can actually send pictures as well. We get quite a lot of that before the one different section saying, I've just found this arrowhead in my garden. Can someone give me a little bit more information about it? And if we can't answer it, we'll forward it on to a specific curator. Um, but with my specific role with regards to the online database is because we've got so many objects in the collection, not all of them are photographed to the database yet. Um, so, and sometimes we'll also get it to saying, um, I think this object is upside down on the database. Can you go and check and we'll check and you will actually correct different photos and upload or take better photos as well. Um, before we send objects out for loans, we do have to do consumer photography. So sometimes if an object hasn't got um, the photos online, we use that condition of photography to put it onto our database, which then gets transferred to uh, the online database as well. Um, sometimes I've actually um, used the online database from the galleries when I'm trying to do um, object shop, just so I know specifically where things go um, as well. So it's nice to have, if we can't access the database from our phones on the gallery, we still use the actual British Museum website to interact with the objects. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. And the information desk guys, they've always got um, access to the website. So when visitors do come in, they ask where specific objects are. Um, they can refer to the collections on my database as well. It's quite a handy resource. I think that's really great. If I remember when COVID hit, the British Museum was one of the first ones that I went to because it was already very extensive, I think. It was cool. My favorite without I mean, I, own, I know I owe other museums no loyalties, but um, my favorite museum during COVID was probably um, the Ashmolean Museum because um, oh. they were fantastic. And they, from like literally day one, they were doing quizzes on their Instagram feed. And I think it's the AAF Tank Museum in the States as well. They, they were on fire during Instagram um, uh, during COVID. They were absolutely, I started following them and it was probably the best thing I ever did just for my museum sigh of relief during COVID. But them and the Ashmolean were fantastic. We were pretty good, but um, it took a while to get going. Okay, maybe I was late to the game. I, I like that you mentioned the Ashmolean Museum, though. I mentioned it in my class, but I didn't know there was an online. Oh, they're fantastic. I love working with them. Um, their Instagram was brilliant. They were doing quizzes about their objects and interacting like daily. It was, yeah, really good. Oh, that's cool. Um, you mentioned you've worked at the British Museum for a while. How have you seen it change over the years? Um, I've worked for a couple of departments. So I worked for, I started with visitor services. So I was working in the galleries and so just a part-time role because I only tended to be there for about six months. Um, but then I kind of stayed for a little bit. Um, so I changed to see it go through, I think the biggest change is when I first started, it was very regimented um, and there was very us versus them kind of um, scenarios, uh, front of house and back of house. Um, but I've gradually seen, and it's not just me going back, it started to change before that. 
I've seen more front of house staff go to work back of house. Um, and they've slowly started yeah. working their way up as well. And um, relationships have definitely cooled and poured. And um, when I was supervising and managing galleries um, from visit services, um, I was always trying my best to show how good visit services can be for the wider museum. Um, we were solving problems and any kind of crazy issues that happen with objects on display or any gallery shenanigans. I was always first to kind of show other curatorial departments, um, see, this is what we do for you. You're actually a service. Um, and it's gradually, and it gradually helps. I mean, although there's always going to be some kind of friction or challenges working in different places, it's really changed in that regard. And um, so there's and the actual uh, wayfaring around exhibitions uh, when they started to listen to the gallery staff about where bottlenecks are in major exhibitions um, and that people need space when they first go into an exhibition. Um, that exhibition design um, has changed just basically due to visit service and people listening to feedback rather than designing an exhibition, not thinking about what the public is going to think when they walk in. Because the member of public doesn't want to walk into 400 people in front of them, they want to walk and have a special experience and see an object rather than the back of like 20 people's heads. Uh, yeah. All the lot. And they find it listen. So that's my major kind of take on what's changed so far. <laughs> if I remember from being in the British Museum, it was like that I had a special experience, not that I was crowded by people. Good. <laughs> that I, was I, a few I, years I, ago. I've run special exhibitions uh, around the Vikings and the Terracross Warriors, and there were some interesting design choices, but now it's been, it's been pretty relaxed. But, um, it's not just COVID, they, there's been some really exhibition, amazing exhibitions, which has been quite free flowing, and um, which is quite proud. It's quite nice to actually go around exhibitions at the moment. Um, another thing I picked up on that you said front of house can often go in the back of house, is that would you recommend if you want to be in museums to start front of house? I would always say um, start front of house first um, because it's a nice way to see how museums run from the ground up. Um, and it's a nice way to see um, the museum and how it's interacted with by visitors. Um, I know some, some people who have never worked front of house and they don't even want to walk through the public gallery to get to various places around the museum. Um, and I don't understand that because I, I love interacting with the public, even though the public sometimes can be a blessing and a curse. Um, but I would always say work with front of house and that way you can actually see what the public sees as a way about the collection. Um, and that will affect how you put things on display. That will reflect the height of how you put things on display. If people are wheelchairs or children or people with visual disabilities, um, and it will affect how you do lighting. Because uh, some people will look at an object and think, oh, it's okay, but they won't hear the public interact with and say, I can't make out the detail on this, or, or I can't read this, or how do I get from A to B? This display case is blocking the way. Um, and it's the little things. Um, and it's also picking up on, because if you're working in the galleries, you'll walk around the whole museum. Whereas if you work in a specific department, you'll only see that one section. So your interaction with the actual collection, um, which a lot of people who work front of house museums, they take it for granted. But when you go to different departments, they'll say, oh, I've never actually been to that department before. Uh, but you already know about not just the object, but how the object is displayed, how it's lit, and how its vulnerable points are. Because you're, when you're checking cases, it might just be for security or health and safety. You actually know what can damage that object, whether the light can affect it, whether there's um, that 10 agents of decay, how which one of those can affect that object you're looking after in the gallery. So there's so many different little things that you'll benefit from in front of housework. And that way you also get to know various departments just from interacting with them in the morning, saying hello to them, saying walk through. And that can kick off a relationship which could end up with you volunteering in departments or getting the confidence up to actually go and shadow different departments and stuff like that. That's how I started. So, and I didn't expect it, so it's all good. If that also makes sense. It did, yeah. Um, when you're working like on a shift, are you in one department? I wasn't clear on what you said, or do you move around? Um, I'm tied to Britain Europe and prehistory. 
Um, so I've been working with those for like the last four or five years. Um, I took a secondment for a year for the Egyptian and Sudan department. Um, we do get loaned out sometimes. Um, so we might get loaned out to the departments if they're short and they need us. Um, but there's a big project going on, like, like a big exhibition needs packing. So we might get loan sent to the loan and display department who are specifically there to take out big loans to all around the world. So they've got a loan, although this is hindsight at the moment because it's not actually happening. Um, we might have one loan going to Japan, another loan going to the States. Um, and each of those needs about five to eight people. Um, and there's not that enough people to go in two different directions. So we might get loans to a little bit like that. That's how I ended up going around Spain for a little bit with the Pharaoh's exhibition uh, from Barcelona, Tarragona, and a few other places. Uh, so yeah, there's just where you get sent to you. We're always going to be working with uh, objects in the collection to present the cover. Oh, that's cool. Very cool. <laughs> how often do you get the opportunity to travel? Um, it depends on um, pandemics. Um, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> before um, the, the year last year, although years have tended to blend recently, um, last year I was supposed to go to, in February I was supposed to be in uh, Toronto. Then I was going to Indianapolis to the Children's Museum to look at some mummies to see if they're okay after, because they're on a long term loan there. Then I was meant to be going back to England, then I think I was going to go to Prague, no Budapest. Then I was going back to Spain for the Egyptian exhibition, and then at some point I was going to Japan, um, but that didn't happen. So since in the last few months I've installed uh, Battle of Barnet objects in the Barnet Museum, um, which was fantastic. Uh, it was my first loan for a long time, so it was really nice to go back. Um, then it was installing Thomas Beckett objects at the Bini in Canterbury, because it was the anniversary of Thomas Beckett. Um, and that so far has been it. Um, but we've, we've done other loans. I packed loans to Paris, but because of travel restrictions, we just, I packed the objects, sent away, and then installed them by the year. Um, but fingers crossed, um, we'll start again at some point. We've still got loans going quite a way. We've got, we sent some people to Australia. Uh, to install a Greek exhibition and we've got a few things going around. But at the moment, um, our travel is just local. But hopefully, it'll get off again soon. Wow, that's a lot. I had no idea you did that. <laughs> um, well, if, uh, on the website, um, it's got, it, there's a section for exhibitions and it says the ones that are going on in the museum, but underneath it says traveling exhibitions that it goes international exhibitions as well. Uh, so we've always got exhibitions going around um, Spain because we've got a deal with like Aisha Banks who do exhibition. Uh, so we've got an uh, American Dream picture exhibition and we've got a Egyptian Pharaoh exhibition. Um, and there's going to be um, there's a Middle East exhibition that goes around as well because I installed that in Barcelona um, a couple of years ago and that's still traveling around as well. So there's always something going on somewhere. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite object or exhibition or? Part of the collection? Mm -hmm. That was one of the questions I was hoping I wouldn't get asked because it, oh. it does change daily. Um, and it's one of the things that I've always thought about doing on my Instagram pages that are like my top 10, but it, ch it also changes. And I would put it up and I go, like, oh, I've changed my mind again. Um, it would probably come down to the Sutton Who collection or the Vindalanda tablets. Um, the Sutton Who is the ship aerial. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon um, ship burial. Um, and one of the reasons I like that is it's not just a really cool looking helmet, it's the rest of the objects that go with it. Um, there's an amazing belt buckle, which is gold, it's high quality, it looks like it was made yesterday. Um, and it's actually got a hidden compartment on the back, which you can't see from the public, which has got a locking mechanism. So when you hold it, it just feels really, really good. You can actually open it and it's actually hollow. Um, but it's got about 14 different animals and beasts hidden in the actual knotwork on the belt buckle, which is just mind blowing. Uh, but the Vindlander tablets, um, uh, do you know the Vindlander tablet? Not too much, no. Uh, they're, they're these tablets that were basically found and excavated from puddles up near Hadrian Vaughan at the garrison town. Um, the excavations are probably still going to go on for another 50 odd years because it's just an amazing site. 
and I'd recommend anyone to go there and touch these things quite. Um, but they are these look like these little cobbled um, pieces of um, scratches, um, but they're actually letters um, written by people who were there at the garrison time. And, um, and one of the reasons I like them is because they translate them. Uh, and one the brilliant thing about objects is even if it can be gold and bling, some who buckle is amazing, uh, but we don't know that the person who it's with, even though there's suggestions it could be a king, but because we don't, we can't prove it, we can't say it. But we don't actually know anything about it. And um, we don't know his words or what he was thinking on that specific day. But the thing about the Bingo Lander tablets is you know who wrote them, if they signed their name, and you know what they were saying, all their thoughts that was going on. Um, there's a lady who was inviting her sister back in the Empire um, to her birthday party on September the 11th. Um, there's shopping lists, there's um, just an amazing, like, some funny, because uh, you always think about those stories of like the glory of Rome and the Empire. Um, but this was right up at Hadrian's Wall, and people who were used to weather in the Empire were not used to going up to the north of England um, and basically being in the garrison. So there was one person complaining um, about the weather and asking for his family to send him socks and sandals because the weather is terrible. Um, and I was up in Scotland for a week last week, and I got rained on every single day. Uh, so even I sent a text message back to my friend saying, I should have bought more socks. Um, so history has not changed in that, that kind of regard. And that's one of the things I find fascinating. Um, my favorite letter um, was from a slave who was writing, who wrote a letter to the centurions, who wrote a letter complaining about the centurions to prefect, um, saying, as a man from overseas, I, can, I can't see I've, I've been unjustly beaten. Um, and that was about 2,000 years ago, um, about basically police, police brutality. Um, and if you think the uh, times last year and the year before, nothing's changed. Um, I find that kind of human element um, fascinating. So yeah, I would definitely put the Things Land of Tablets up there as number one. Even if you walk through the gallery, you would just see these little bits of dull card, um, and you wouldn't bat an eyelid. But if you read them, they're just the stories are amazing. That's really cool. Um, when you do the British Muse, when you do the exhibits, are you are you able to talk about modern connections like that, or do you just let visitors make those connections themselves? Um, we don't. Um, <laughs> um, sadly, they don't. Um, when I do, because I train up a lot of staff um, from the services, which is one of the things I still do, and I always stop at the big long tablets, and I tell them about them, and tell them people who read them, and I kind of make them make the connection as well. Um, but when it comes to visitors, because um, there's only there's a finite amount of space you can work with, and you have yeah. to put the context of how an object was found, conditions, and um, how it's gone to translate and stuff like that. So there's only a little bit of space you can work with, um, unless they have an all exhibition to themselves, which they, they really could. Um, most of the time, you'll have to leave the visitors to make that connect all the dots. Yeah, I was just thinking about when I was at the British Museum. <laughs> Well, there, there is an experimental gallery, um, which you go into the museum and turn right. Um, it's called Gallery 3, and sometimes they've got smaller exhibitions of less objects, and they're kind of a modern take of how you display things in there. And it's pretty cool. Sometimes it's very hit and miss, um, although I probably get in trouble if anyone hears that. Um, but sometimes it really works, and sometimes it does show it connects all the dots for you, and it shows objects back then, and that connects the past and the present. Um, so sometimes it works, it depends on how it's done, really. Okay, that's interesting. Um, do you have anything in the collection that you haven't explored fully yet, or something you want to display that you haven't yet? Um, I am one of the noisiest members of staff, um, probably in the museum. And I think it's good to be noisy, just because you work in the museum, you already have to be inquisitive. So any locked door I go past, just from a security perspective, I always make sure that somebody's in their room, um, if I haven't seen that door open before when I was on visit services, and it got me into a lot of bits of the collection. It's like, oh, hello, do you want to see what's inside? And I'll be the first person to say, yeah, yeah, I will. Thank you very much. My name's Richard, nice to meet you. And then you'll be presented with, I mean, sometimes, yes, you'll get sold. Yes, we're in here, don't worry about it. Um, there are a few places where I've not been to in the collection. Um, but there's also some things which you instantly not and shouldn't want to go and see. 
um, there are specific um, hazards involved um, and poisons, like literally hazards, hazards can kill you. Um, so there are certain places that I won't go get involved with. Um, there are things I would love to put on display myself, um, and members of staff at certain points you can put in uh, exhibition kind of like proposal. And um, that's open to all members of staff, and then it will go to the certain like collections committee to see if it gets approval. Um, I would like to see more um, deaf masks on display because I'm biased because we've got a lot of deaf masks in the collection. Um, and I find the whole subject of deaf quite interesting through history and how it's changed, especially it's been quite whitewashed. Uh, whereas deaf and human remains is all human remains is quite a big issue these days. It's becoming more a relevant issue at museums. So I would like to see more kind of talk on on that and how they would actually go about putting more things on display. Because um, back in the Victorian days when it, they kind of brought back the death masks and death masks are coming in again at the moment, again against the conversation of human remains and how they kind of curate the difference, if that makes sense. Then we've got a lot of good death masks, some are a little bit dodgy. Um, but it'll be nice to put some of that on display. That does go for my gothic roots as well, though, so like, I'm a bit biased. That does sound cool. I'd be interested in seeing it, too. <laughs> yeah, so some of the death masks we've got um, are quite done in a, in a rush. We've got a death mask of George Bernard Shaw, which um, was done a couple of hours after his death, and it just looks like he's just asleep. It's done so well. You can actually just see the lines across his head, and it's a beautiful thing to see, but also can be seen as quite macabre kind of thing as well. We, we go back to the Roman days or they've still got death masks there and it's done as a kind of a tribute and a remembrance because you couldn't just put a mosaic up or a, a painting straight away or take an Instagram photo. So the, the actual death mask was a sign of remembrance as well. So the death is, the subject of death is changing with different cultures and ideals. So it would be interesting exhibitions to put on for that. Yeah, you do talk about death a bit in the British Museum. I just remember that. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> but for European prehistory, uh, yeah, there's a lot of death involved, um, literally from the very early days. Um, I think I landed in the right department. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the last question I'm going to ask is advice for somebody who wants to be in the field? Um, in the field of museums? Yeah. Um, I did a couple, I did a blog post a couple of months ago um, and it was such a hard question because I kept on getting lots lots of questions of like how did you get your job and how did you get into the museum mm -hmm. and there was no one direct answer so I, I did a like, whole series of like suggestions for it because um, I don't just like, a lot of people just say start volunteering and see how you go because I don't like using the D word because I don't like telling people you're going to have to do this and you're not going to get paid for it um, and you might not even get a job at the end of it. Um, I think the first thing I would say is don't just think museums and I need to work in a museum. Um, have a look into museums and see what jobs you could do in a museum um, because there are so many different jobs. Um, lots, some people will come in and they will instantly think, I'm working in a museum, I'm going to be a curator. Um, but nine times out of ten, it's probably not going to go like that because it's very competitive. And there are already people that are going to be in that job pretty much until the day they die or get told to retire. Um, and even when they do retire, they're going to come back to be a fellow or an academic researcher. So it's quite hard to get those specific jobs. Um, so I'll say, know what job you want and then learn how to do it. Um, so my job, um, there's a lot of technical, because um, a lot of places you go to, we're called museum tech. Because um, when we put an object on display, it's not just getting this object, put it on a shelf, and then walking away from it. We might have to make mounts for it, we're going to have to pack it, um, we're going to have to do some pinning, um, which is how you work with workshop um, equipment, how you work with workshop materials, knowing what materials to use. Um, so it's all little things like that, just for my specific role. Um, then there's illustrators for objects and catalogs, there's museum photographers, um, there are curators, so then, but then you've got to think of what area you want to go into. Um, we've had people applying for jobs in my department and they put down, I really like your department because I've done an excavation, which is really, really good, but just because you've done excavations and archaeology doesn't 
tell anybody you can actually handle objects or know anything about putting an object on display or how do you transport. Things. So it's thinking about what jobs you want to go to and trying to find the specific tasks of how to actually get that job. Um, and then yes, you might have to send out emails um, and letters to different um, museums and ask them specifically, can you shadow or volunteer to actually work alongside the specific department. Um, every museum has got a volunteer coordinator, but you, I wouldn't say just go with that, specifically write to different departments and find out what roles are available to each other, if that makes sense. Because um, then you've got marketing departments as well, you've got communications. So if people might want to go to a museum, you might not want to get to work with objects, but you can actually work with broadcast units, you can do the Facebook, you do the documentaries, and you can work with the film groups and things like that. Or you could work in visitor services and get your foot in the door and then start that way, which uh, a lot of people have done as well, which then goes back to the first question too. Yeah, I think people only think about a couple of positions. And I think also people think archaeology, museums and anthropology, they're all like meshing together. <laughs> yeah, but you get a lot of private um, archaeological companies as well. Um, that do excavations. Um, Museum of London are quite, doing quite well from their archaeological um, department. And they're kind of like spreading outside of London as well. Um, but you also get people that when I, I've asked, a, when I've been training the group and there's about 20 people in the room and I say, right, I need to get to know you so I can target a specific course to your needs. Um, so and I'll ask them, one, who did museum studies and a few people put their hands up and then to who's done classics, and then the rest of the group guaranteed to put their hands up. But, uh, but none of them have had any museum experience at all, and that'll be their first day, first museum job. They've come straight out of university, and one of them said, they want, I asked them, um, why did you want to work in the museum? They said, oh, I've come out of university, and I want to be a curator. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm sure if you get some um, curator of what? And they just went, um, a collection. But they didn't actually say what collection they didn't have in their mind about the specifics they wanted straight they just had this idealized um, version of what a curator would be they didn't actually think about the collection they wanted to look after or how they present it they just saw the curator and that was it so research what you want how you want it, specific objects and um, time periods and then go for it that way and always remember I think, the basics i think that's really good it's really important to say So that's all I have for today. Thank you for chatting with me, Richard. Oh, no worries. Thank you for having me. You've been less stressful and nervous than I thought. <laughs> that's good. Okay, thank you for watching that. I hope you all enjoyed the discussion. It was a really special discussion for me to be a part of too, because as I said, the British Museum is a museum I've always looked up to in my studies. So it was great to hear from somebody in the field. Um, to recap a couple of the points that Richard said, something I really found fascinating was um, he says the public does not want to walk into 400 people. They want to have a special experience. So this is something I think that's really important in museums. You'll notice now in COVID that there's also timed exhibitions so people can still have their special experience. but. Um, yeah, you have to be safe and things like that. And you also have to make the experience um, very good for people. Throughout this course, I've been trying to make it clear that museum visits are very personal for people and people really want to have the most er enriching experience that they can in museums. So I think if there's a lot of people around, then it can be kind of daunting. You can feel pressure or, you know, different feelings. You don't know how somebody is feeling. And I think that's also why in museums, you'll sometimes see chairs for people to sit and contemplate what they've seen, um, especially if the collection or culture being represented is very close to you or triggers something. I think that these are things to think about. So if there's lots of people around, then that's very important. And um, yeah, there's lots of things to think about. And another thing in the terms of a lot of people, I think this is really interesting in terms of the British Museum, which is obviously a very big institution and they wanna keep, um, keep the business that they have. So it's very interesting that they try and make it um, personal for people and not just try and get people in and out, you know. These are things that people think about as a business 
and as a place for viewing things. Another thing that I was thinking about throughout this discussion is the high importance of public in representation. Richard mentioned two things. First of all, the public, they can comment on if a photo in the collection is not good or also if your display techniques could be better in terms of accessibility and things like that or the information displayed is not good i think if you as one person if you think something and you don't go forward with it then other people uh with the same background as you might be thinking the same thing and they would have a better experience because you brought forth your experience and your um, your hesitations about the display. I hope that made sense. Basically, if you don't come forward, someone else might or someone else might not. Personally, I think this represents the role of the curator as well. Even though you might have researched all you can and you have the best intentions in a display, the public can always find something different in your interpretation. They can always interpret something different and make it better. So it's very important to have a good relationship with the public. Lastly, I think Richard did a great job of highlighting the importance of the front of house. If you think about your museum experiences, it's probably the front of house people that you interact with the, the most and that you ask questions of. Even though the collections manager or the curator may have been responsible for the exhibition, it's the front of house, the people who are responsible for talking with visitors that are answering these questions. So that's very important. I think the front of house they deserve a lot of respect and I think like Richard said, if you start front of house then you can always build a career from there. Um, whether that be volunteering, whatever it is, never undervalue your role as a front of house. I know some of you from looking in the introduction, some of you worked in front of house as well so that's very interesting. So I think you should think about this if you decide to go forward into museums. Moving forward this week, I'll be guiding you through some more object studies such as some of the ones Richard mentioned, for example, the letter from people who were working in the north of England. And then Richard as a collections manager, he was experiencing similar feelings of rain and similar feelings of being wet and things like that. So I think it's really interesting how objects can allow you to feel similar feelings of somebody who was in a different time, but in the same mind space as you will be thinking about things like that. It's not my intention to repeat everything that was said in the discussion in my recap, so I'm gonna stop here. Um, if you have any questions for Richard, let me know and I'll pass it on to him, but if not, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.